Great, thank you very much. Uh, in advance of the panel, I'm just going to make a very, very few plain spoken observations and make a few predictions about the future. Uh, first, I do want to acknowledge two people. I want to acknowledge uh, the American ambassador to Sweden, Mark Brzezinski, who's here with us. It's a testament to the importance of the bilateral relationship between the United States and Sweden that somebody so trusted by President Obama and Secretary Clinton has been fairly recently appointed as our ambassador. So thank you, Ambassador Brzezinski, for attending today. I also want to acknowledge Ambassador Eileen Donahoe, who is the United States' ambassador to the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva. A lot of very good and important work being done in the internet freedom domain is being done in Geneva at the Human Rights Council and is being stewarded by Ambassador Donahoe. So Ambassador Donahoe, thank you for joining us today. And then lastly, I do, I think it's very important to single out the leadership on the issue of internet freedom of Carl Bildt. Um, in the office of Secretary of State Clinton, it will surprise none of you that we focus very much as, we've, as we think about the issue of internet freedom in the context of a 195 country global strategy. One of the most important elements, of course, is leadership. And I can point to no better leader uh, in Europe and, and beyond on these issues of internet freedom. And Carl Bildt is one of those people who in the last two years has helped take internet freedom from a piece of sort of foreign policy arcana to something that is legitimately at sort of the, the grown-ups table of foreign policy. So thank you, Foreign Minister Bill. A few brief observations. First, Secretary Clinton said something very important yesterday in Brasilia at a conference focused on open government that I think is, is important in the context of today's discussions, and she said the principal conflict of the 21st century, the principal division between societies is going to be between open and closed. It's not going to be east versus west. It's not going to be between religions. From my own perspective, where the 20th century, to the extent that you could create sort of a binary political division to describe the 20th century as a struggle between left and right, in the 21st century, the principal binary political struggle will be between open and closed. And internet freedom is at the core of this conflict. And given that, I think that the next five years, if I were to look out the next five years and think about the struggle for internet freedom, I actually think that the challenges over the next three to five years are going to be significantly greater than the challenges to internet freedom in the last three, or five, in the last three to five years. And the reason for that, bluntly, has to do with the issue of power, for lack of a more polite or diplomatic term. There is a massive shift in geopolitical power taking place right now. Most people who talk about shifts in geopolitical power do so on geographic terms. They talk about power shifting from west to east, from America and Europe to Asia, or from the global north to the global south. Whether one believes this to be true or not, I do believe that there is a shift in power taking place, but it's not on geographic terms. It is from hierarchies including government, there's a shift in power from hierarchies to citizens and networks of citizens. And the internet is the principal enabler of that shift in geopolitical power. And the, in the face of this loss of power, established hierarchies, whether they are large media companies, whether they are governments, that power is not going to be given up willingly. And as the internet plays a more meaningful and a more powerful role, helping to distribute power away from hierarchies to citizens and networks of citizens, there is going to be a backlash from established authorities. 
And to be clear, this is not a case of, you know, an American sort of finger wagging at the rest of the world, saying, oh, look what's happening in the Middle East, oh, look what's happening in China. This redistribution of power from hierarchies to citizens and networks of citizens as made possible by the internet is happening in the United States as much as anywhere. You know, one need look no further than the debate over two pieces of proposed internet piracy legislation that failed in our Congress, SOPA and PIPA, than to see the degree to which internet-enabled citizen-centered movements are powerful in ways that were almost unimaginable five years ago. And in the face of this, the one observation that I make to leaders of these hierarchies, government, CEOs of media companies or elsewhere, is simple. It's that the 21st century is a lousy time to be a control freak. And that the control that you might have had 10, 15, 20 years ago over information, over distribution, over other such things, the kind of control that you once had and which you today covet is gone and it's not coming back. And the choice that you then make as a leader about how to respond to this empowerment of your, of your citizens, how you respond to this connectivity, how you respond to this loss of control is going to be the ultimate measure of the, the values of, of that hierarchy. Let me make just three predictions now uh, before closing my remarks. Uh, as I think about the next three to five years. Uh, the first, I think we are gonna see the rise of dark nets. In an, in an environment of increasingly powerful and sophisticated tools of surveillance, one choice netizens are going to, are making, which I think will expand dramatically, is the growth of so-called dark nets. These are closed encrypted intranets that provide communications exclusively between a set of authenticated users. Sometimes they operate over physical networks that are separate from the telecommunication system. Sometimes they operate on highly secure channels. Sometimes they operate in the alleyways and side streets of the internet, like the chat channels in multi-user online gaming worlds. Darknets are in part a response to significant shifts in the architecture of the internet over the last few years. Ironically, the last few years of major market developments have taken the vast disintermediated, decentralized network of internet users and begun to centralize their activity. This is the centralization that brings the benefits of cloud computing and thin client server-based infrastructure, but it also creates a small number of highly vulnerable points in the system where users aggregate data. In the face of this, at a, at a convening like this one in three years, I predict people will be talking a lot about darknets. Prediction number two, uh, the four foci of internet freedom debates are largely concentrated around the United States, the EU, Russia, and China. Those are the four principal protagonists in the struggle for internet freedom globally. However, I believe that to the extent that the fight for internet freedom is either won or lost, to put things in more, in, in oversimplified terms, is not going to be based on what happens in those four traditional foci, though they will remain important. But I believe that the fight for internet freedom will be won or lost in a group of what I think are about 30 fence-sitting nations. Nations that are becoming uh, newly hyper-networked themselves from Thailand to Turkey, who themselves are now determining what the norms for internet use will be in their countries. So I really think over the next three to five years, the fight for internet freedom will be won or lost based on the activities of these 30 or so countries. And then my final prediction is sort of a, a, a riff based on Darwin. We are in an environment of hyper-competition between nation-states uh, within the private sector and elsewhere. And in the face of the disruptive change, both positive and negative, brought about by hyper-connectivity, I believe that it's not the strongest 
of the species that will survive, nor the most intelligent, but that most adaptable to change. It's those entities, it's those organizations that will most quickly and most intelligently adapt to change more so than those that are historically the strongest or most intelligent that will compete and succeed most effectively in the next three to five years. So with that, I will thank you and look forward to some open discussion and Q&A with the panel. Alec. Thank you very much, Alec. Well, a lot of interesting themes that, that both pick up some of the conversations we were having earlier and also lead us very nicely into the central position of this uh, session, which is about the interplay between technology and what it enables on the one hand uh, for good, for freedom, and its disruptive power. This term we've heard already today, and I predict, my prediction is that we will be hearing a lot more about the disruptive force of the internet. Um, so let me introduce you to our distinguished panel. We have Carl Bildt, the uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs, former Prime Minister. I think you were the first, uh, you sent the first email message between heads of state, didn't you, back in the 90s? Apart from the fact that I wasn't head of state, but head of government, <laughs> but, 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 but apart from that, yeah. And you didn't write it, or oh, you did? I, di I can tell you a story later, it's quite fun, but <laughs> we'll you. take that. I have Robin Tagland here, who is an associate professor um, at the Centre for Strategy and Competitiveness at the Stockholm School of Economics. I have Mons Adler, who is the evangelist and founder or maybe it's the other way around, founder and evangelist for Bambuza, mm -hmm. and Rasha Ab Abdullah, associate professor of journalism and mass communication at the American University in Cairo. Welcome to you. Now, you will have observed, the more observant of you will have, have observed. Actually, do you think we could get the podium moved back? Because I think it's blocking mm. the sight lines for many in the room. Would that be possible? Could somebody move the podium back? Or maybe I'll move it. Let's do that. So I think we, we should have a bit more freedom to see each other. Um, <laughs> so one of the things that you may have observed is that you're all sort of sitting in tables. And so the idea is that, that, that this should promote some interaction at the micro level. So I have a couple of questions. Uh, maybe to, could, could we ask you to think about your uh, reactions to Alex opening remarks and in particular place yourselves five to ten years down the line what technological <coughs> advancement or change do you think is going to have the most impact whether good or not so good on our freedoms we've already heard about you know uh, some ideas that, that might stimulate some some conversations about this is a bad time to be a control freak and uh, and the you know, remarks from Secretary Clinton about, you know, even the most enlightened, that the nations that are taking the most leadership role uh, on, on advocating internet freedoms don't always get it right. That these are struggles, these are complex mm -hmm. issues where the technology, business, civil society are all interplaying and this geopolitical shift that, that Alec predicted, not uh, uh, not actually a geographically bounded, but in fact uh, from hierarchies to the individuals. So I'm going to start with you, Mons Adler, as I think um, uh, the the innovator, the the the, <laughs> the, uh, the the business representative on our panel here. Can you tell me if you think to five to ten years in the future? Do you think it will be possible for somebody like you to set up something like Bambooza? Do you think that, um, you know, what technological uh, changes, not so much in the techiness, but how will the landscape change for, for, for good or not so good? I think, I mean, the probability for something like Bambooza to appear will, of course, happen. Um, um, the major movement that we've seen during the last five years is adding real time or time as a dimension to the web, which has enabled much larger interaction and dialogue between people. And that has simply come to the fact that it's been easier to access internet and especially cheaper. You know, um, the time dimension of the web before was very dysfunctional. And that was due to the fact that it cost too much to be online all the time. 
Uh, you know, I remember when I called my friends to, you know, tell them to get on to MSN or something like that. That was <laughs> how it used to be. Um, and I think that is probably the most important movement that we got to see is that the access and the price of access need to go down globally all over the place. And I would love Sweden to see, you know, as, I mean, as the welfare state to give a free SIM card to every born citizen. You know, you could use internet freely, uh, get access a la gratis and, and so on. That, that would be beautiful and I think that would really level a, a large extent of innovation on all scales, you know, because I see people in the suburban areas not having access all the time at the moment, and they're missing out on a lot of the fun. So you make the, the link between access and, and you know, that great things happen, uh, you know, that we can't quite predict in terms of innovation, that freedom to innovate. Um, can I ask you, Russia, uh, uh, we, we heard on the last panel that there are now, I think, is it five billion uh, mobile internet users in, uh, in Africa, or mobile users in Africa, in the continent of Africa. Have you yourself perceived uh, the impact of, of uh, people getting online and lower costs of connection? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure about the, the number, probably, uh, I don't think it's five billion, but it's... Uh, it's, it's sorry. It is, yeah, it's <laughs> in the world. I think the number that was mentioned was 80 percent. Mm. Um, and again, I'm, I'm not sure uh, of the exact number uh, at this moment, but but it is quite high. Uh, but yes, I mean, um, and that actually answers to to the point that the, that you raised about um, you know what did the technology do and look where the Arab Spring is. And I think the technology has done a very important uh, thing. I mean, I. I this, this has been my line of research for the past, you know, 10, 15 years and, and uh, over the last three or four years I've kind of focused more on social media and that naturally led me to political activism for the past three years or so. And, um, I mean, there, I, you know, I could do a whole day on, on, on what social media has done and, and not done um, because at the end of the day it's not the social media that that go down on the squares, it's the people that go down on the squares. But how the people use the social media is incredibly important. And what the social media or, or the internet in general has done to the people in the Arab region is incredibly important. But I, I'll give you what I think has been um, maybe the, the most important uh, uh, contribution in, in um, and there are several. Uh, the minister said in the morning that, you know, the countries that fear um, information are countries that fear their own future and uh, if I may modify the tweet I'll just say that it's actually it's the governments oh, yeah. and not the country because the people are not afraid of the information that people want the information that people demand the information but it's the governments that are afraid of letting people get access to information and I take that as a very good sign uh, I think our government, for one, is quite afraid to let people get access to information. They haven't been very successful other than the five days uh, during which they totally shut down internet access uh, in Egypt, and that was um, almost the only way for them to block people, because when they tried blocking Twitter, within 10 minutes we were all on Twitter, <laughs> and then they tried blocking Facebook, and we had already shown people how to get you know, uh, on that, and, and that was obviously not going to work. And so they decided to just shut off the whole internet. Uh, and, uh, and at the time, I mean, and even now, I mean, the idea is almost not perceivable for, for a country to shut down the whole internet traffic. And um, uh, last, actually last uh, June at the, at the UN uh, Human Rights Council, I uh, spoke to Mr. Frank Leroux about the idea of um, uh, initiating some kind of an, of an international law, and I'm not a lawyer, so I have no idea of the legal details, but I would really like to see this happen uh, someday, uh, to hold the, the head of the state personally responsible for a crime, an international crime, of blocking internet access to a whole country or to a whole region. Because when the internet was cut off in Egypt, people died. And when the internet was cut off in Syria, people died. It's not just something that we, that we can take lightly. Uh, the internet is not, uh, it's not a luxury anymore. It's not a, it's not a, um, a second rate or a second stage uh, 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 commodity that, that you get only after you get you know, food and shelter and whatever. Not to say that the basic needs, of course, I mean, the hierarchy of, of needs remain 
Usha, uh, can I just, I sure. just wanted to uh, throw your proposition out to the audience there. What do you think of that? What do you think of Russia's suggestion that the head of state ought to be made personally responsible and personally liable for cutting off the internet in their country? Do you think that has legs? Can we just have a show of hands? <laughs> Who thinks that's a good idea? <laughs> Our head of government, oh, we've charge. got an amendment whoever, there whoever from over charge. there. Yeah. Um, um, sir? The mic. Yes, um, it's possible to hand uh, to um, take our responsibility both not only the head of the state, but also the Council of Ministers, because sure. they are individually and collectively responsible as a government. Can we also throw in as well the people who enable that? Let's say the providers who, who actually have to flick the switches, are they going to be part of but, that? But one of the most important obstacles is that the people who use uh, the civil society is not as organized, as systemically organized as we want it to be. That's also a problem. So the, if you want to challenge a government, you need very smart men and women with good heart, and that's very important. So when I look at many developing countries, the civil society is very weak than we expect it to be or we hope it to be. So we, the, the, there is a need to strengthen the capacity of civil society. There should be one step ahead yes. of government. And of course, that was a, a point um, made very eloquently by Henriette Esterhausen on the last panel, <coughs> that the interplay between the, the, you know, the democratic process involves also civil society, and that the, you know, the, 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 the aftermath of these huge popular movements that we've been seeing and are seeing at the moment is also an area where there, there is work to be done. And there should, be, a, sorry, and there should just... be an alliance, a coalition between the civil society and the business sector as well, yes. because they want freedom. And we have a, a cut, so we're, we're mentioning all of the stakeholders here. Now, Carl Bilt, can I turn to you, uh, the foreign minister? Our previous speaker, Rasha Abdullah, talked about the role of governments here. But it, when we think about Alec Ross's remarks, he was talking about the, you know, one of the aspects of cloud computing, this technology, is that it places a lot of control over a great deal of information in the hands of a few, mostly private sector, mostly US, no offence, but it is true, uh, corporations. No, it's, uh, it's all right. We, li we like having we all like this that. job growth <laughs> and all this wealth. So uh, the question I pose to you is, is this just something that governments need to be worried about? Or should we, as people interested in internet freedoms, also be posing the same questions of these corporations? And will the advance, sorry, it's too many questions, but <laughs> the advance of cloud computing is the context that, that, that we're thinking about in this? Well, of course, there are, there are concerns, there are questions, there are things that we need to, to discuss, but I think overall, it's a rather positive development. I mean, think of all of the servers that were under national control. Then it would be very much more easy for the national government X to just cut it off, yes. and that would be the end of yeah. the story. Now it's in the cloud. The cloud is not under control of the Swedish government, not even under control of the US government. It might be part of it is under control of the company X, Y, and Z. But at the same time, one of the, I said previously, is very difficult to make predictions about the future. I would make the prediction that most of these companies that we are talking about now, they are unlikely to exist in 20 years' time. They did not exist 20 years ago. It's such a rapid evolution of technology that if there's one company that misuses its market position or whatever you call it, it's going to fail because people will go otherwise. I mean, there's not one cloud. There are lots of clouds on the sky and uh, they're all hovering above the globe. And I think for all of the problems that are there, no question about it, um, I think the possibilities are far greater. Could, could I just make one further comment, which is based also on what you discussed, shutting down the net, open societies, um, and, and related to the question that was in Syria in, in, in the last discussion. I mean, my take on how to do these things is that the best thing we can do with closed societies, or societies to try to be closed, is to swarm them with nets. The more nets, the more networks, the more connectivity, the better. 
roll in as much as we can. Uh -huh. Because the more there is, the more difficult to control. Then, on top of that, as we discussed, don't export any controlling technologies to them, as far as we can control that. It's fortunate there's got to be others who've got to do it. I mean, I'm not going to mention big countries in East Asia, but there are others that might do it, but we shouldn't do it. And then, third element of policy, roll in the other technologies that make it possible to break through the walls. I illustrated that with what I talked about President Obama and Iran. They have extremely strict sanctions on Iran for virtually everything, but they're lifting sanctions on a lot of internet technologies in order to make the networks work. Same thing we are trying to do with Syria, in consultation with the Syrian opposition, by the way, inside Syria. The networks must work. They must be able to use Skype. We are even delivering communication equipment to the people inside Syria to make it possible for them to connect to the outside world. Don't deliver any monitoring equipment. We don't. I don't think any European country does, as a matter of fact. Um, and then other technologies as well that make it possible to break through. The best safeguard against governments shutting down the net totally, I think, is that it's the nets everywhere. One of the lessons from Cairo, I think, is that uh, the regime found after these three or five days or whatever it was, it simply didn't work. The reaction against shutting down the nets less, I mean, from the regime point of view, the popular reaction against shutting down the net was so strong that they had to take up the net again. And the same, my favorite example is China. A couple of years ago when they had the sort of the unrest in Xinjiang. And as we discussed, they have some restrictions on the internet, mildly speaking. But when there was uh, the unrest in Xinjiang, they didn't even trust their own control of the net. They had to shut down the entire net because the controls didn't work. But at after a while, you can't shut down the entire net because you shut down society. It's like shutting out water or air or whatever. So they had to take it on. Um, so that's why my policy conclusion is make societies, the more connected they are to the net, to the cloud, um, let's handle the problems associated with that. But the positive force of that is far greater than the problems. Thank you. I'm going to come to, to Robin Tegland. I'd, I'd like your reaction to Alec Ross's opening remarks about the shift between uh, from governments, from hierarchies, from large companies to, to I think you would call it the collective, wouldn't it? Wouldn't you? D is this something that you see? And what are what are the obstacles that you think? Let's let's challenge this assumption a little bit. <laughs> what if she was going to agree with me? Well, <laughs> in that case, I'm going to ask someone in the audience. <laughs> No, I think that's a very, a very good question, and I liked a lot of his comments in terms of the um, aspect of hyper-competition, uh, seeing hierarchies uh, breaking down, moving over. But at the same time, I, we're he we're, I am hearing a lot about uh, government and government's um, actions related to freedom. I think we do need to think about companies and business and how they perhaps restrict our freedom, as well as technology and how that might restrict our freedoms. Because on the one hand, you can have technology lock-in, for example. If you have, go too far down one road, then this part of the world might get stuck in this type of technology and not be able to jump. You do have technology traps. And at the same time, I think what's very important, you talked about power. There's informal power as well. I study networks, and it's fascinating to see, on the one hand, one talks about formal power, but there's also a very strong component, which is informal power. Who has control and access over the resources, the flow of resources in a network? So those are the most central. And at the moment, you can say that, yes, we have very big winner-take-all companies, don't we? We have Google, we have Facebook, we have Apple. And the question is, how are they? I mean, we think, oh, you know, our freedom, but am I really free in the sense that, okay, if I go on Twitter, I'm tweeting. A friend of mine, he was tweeting, and he was unable to retweet. Twitter said stop. Or I'm on Facebook, and their algorithms do that I see this group of people and not this group of people. Did I decide that? So I think I, this yeah. might be the reason why I always get anti-wrinkle um, uh, <laughs> adverts and also weight yeah. loss adverts <laughs> whenever, whenever I'm on uh, Facebook. But, but you're yeah. right that, 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 that I, I think this also leads us into um, this, this idea which was, which was picked up by some of our speakers earlier that the, the internet is of course a great power for, uh, for freedom for empowering innovation, as we've seen, um, and the, the link between internet access and growth in GDP. 
so that there are all sorts of good news stories, but also I think as your friend, or uh, the friend of the US, Julian Assange might have said, <laughs> the internet is also one great big spying machine. And the very countries, uh, uh, you know, I'm from the UK, so let's, let's all, um, uh, it's already come in for some criticism. Our government announced the other day that it wants to uh, work on intercepting emails, intercepting web traffic. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I believe that the US government is pouring a lot of money into similar research. Mm -hmm. I understand, uh, I may be wrong, that the FRA law in, in Sweden itself also provides the state with this capability. So my question to all of you, to, to all of you is, uh, so is the internet, is it compatible with freedom? When we talk about freedom, and um, we lecture other nations about their repression of people and repressions of freedom, is it compatible with that to also be pouring money into um, effectively surveillance? Alec Ross? <laughs> <laughs> um, so first I think that you know, we're taking all internet policy issues and now calling them internet freedom. I'm happy to respond to all manner of internet policy issues, but when I think about internet freedom, you know, from my standpoint, that's the freedom to connect to the internet, to the websites of one's choosing and to each other. So, you know, surveillance technologies and other such things, I think, are tangential to it, but I'm happy to respond to it. So first, you know, we have, within the United States, it's no surprise, uh, you know, the capabilities for um, doing what we call lawful interceptive of personal communications. The thing about the United States is while we have these very, tech, these very powerful technologies, what is important is that there be a strong rule of law behind it to ensure that if somebody's personal communications are intercepted, there has to be an individual adjudication in a court where um, you know, an individual's name, it, the, with, so that there's probable cause given, a, a um, judge says, yes, there is probable cause, yes, you may surveil this person's personal information. So the rule of law behind all of this is important. Now, I don't think it's naive. I, I think it's important to not be overly naive and say that there are absolutely no circumstances under which um, government can surveil somebody's communications. I mean, just I'll put this in the first person. You know, there was a threat against me and my kids. It was a reasonable threat. It was a credible threat. It was a real threat. You know, this person had communicated, me through, communicated to me through social networks, made some specific threats, and an individual adjudication was made to say, yes, the communications from this person in, in Indiana to Alec Ross are sufficient to determine whether there is a credible threat there and to intercept the communications. It turned out that there was. So in this case, threats to my kids were actually sufficient to identify this one person and figure out if his communications were such that it was real or not. It was. So I think it's important to not be utopian about these things. As long as there's a strong rule of law undergirding all of these things, then I think that you can reconcile a lawful intercept with internet freedom. So your, the, the difference that you make is the, the backing of the rule of law, and in right. your case, the example that you've given is about uh, having specific judicial intervention to enable that surveillance to take place. Is that the case in, 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 the, in, say, in Sweden with the FRA? Does that require specific judicial intervention prior to the surveillance taking place? Carl Bildt. Yeah, well, yes, um, essentially yes. Uh, we've had that for a very long time in terms of tapping telephones. Um, of course, I mean, I think every country does it to a certain extent, but it requires, now we're talking about the old world, fixed lines, things like that. But you have to go to a court of law. Uh, it, it's a secret process, as to be yeah. said, but the security services uh, go to the court of law and say, we have reason to suspect that this guy, we need to have some control of him, and the court says yes or no. And there's a public report to Parliament, or public anyhow, every year that indicates the number of cases that is done. Now, with the internet, it becomes somewhat more complicated, uh, but it's essentially the same thing. So for any sort of specific activity to be targeted, it requires a process which is essentially legal. Yes. Because this is something that I think often gets, um, gets fuzzed up 
in the, uh, in the debate about internet freedom, that if you are advocating freedom, freedom of, uh, of no, expression, no, but it, yeah, but that, 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 that therefore you must never ever do anything like surveillance, no, phone tapping and so on. Which is a mistake, because I mean freedom, a free society is based on an element of order as well. Then the balance between that order and the freedom, I mean that's nothing new, that's been with us in Platon, more or less, in different versions. We are discussing the application of exactly the same principles in a new technology age, but there's nothing new. The complete freedom, that's the word of Hobbes, where everyone can shoot everyone. We don't allow that. We are against that, to be precise. And, and we have authorities to prevent it. Um, then we must have the rule of the law. And that's okay in the United States and Sweden. It becomes more tricky, as Alex pointed out, in a couple of countries, I think he was exactly right in pointing out that the battle is now being fought in a couple of sort of borderline countries, where sort of principles might be somewhat different from what is in our countries, and where there might be a tendency to go more in the direction of order and control than in the direction of freedom. That's why this debate is so important, to make certain that that borderline is drawn the right way. But to say that there is no borderline to be drawn, that's to misread the lesson of history. Thank you. Mom Sadler? Yeah, I think it's really important to, to sort of state the philosophical structure of surveillance in that case, because the problem with surveillance is, if you look at it today, it's, a, it's a sensors or cameras that are getting information, and that information is locked down to a small group of people. And therefore, due to the fact that they have more information about how people move and so on, they also get a higher power, you know, the knowledge they know get them into a power situation. Um, the logic of our service that we provide is that mm -hmm. the surveillance camera is open to everybody. Mm -hmm. And if we would look into a world where surveillance cameras would be accessible by every citizen, I would wonder if we see them as a surveillance camera or more if we see them as an extension of the public space. Uh, because the access on the, on the other end is probably more important. So what you're effectively uh, proposing is no privacy, mm. effectively, which is an interesting, uh, yeah. it's an interesting, uh, it's an, uh, I mean, uh, that, uh, am I wrong? I don't know, uh, that, that's what I, s I see. Uh, gen there was a gentleman there who wanted to <laughs> ask a question, sir. Please go ahead. I think there's a mic. If you just introduce yourself briefly before you pose the question. And there's also someone at the back as well, so we Thank can you go very to much. you next. Uh, my name is Oliver Sume. I'm uh, Vice President of the European ISP Association, the largest ISP association in the world. And I would um, like to contribute to what uh, Alec Ross and also Eric Bild said concerning surveillance and monitoring and lawful interception based on laws and based on the rule of laws. Um, that might be right, but I just would like to point out um, I don't know if you are aware of the fact that all over Europe, ISPs are forced um, to, um, to um, enter corporations and where they would monitor the traffic, where they would monitor their clients, and besides the rule of law, besides laws, just on a basis of um, private corporations, that's something that the ISPs in Europe try to oppose very much. Um, but there is a strong approach, uh, approach, not only in many member states, but also um, on, uh, in Brussels um, at the Commission to, to encourage ISPs to do exactly um, these things. I think this is a very um, dangerous development and all of us, not only the ISPs, should be aware of um, the fact that if we start to do um, monitoring, filtering or blocking um, on a cooperative basis, that this is um, absolutely the wrong way um, to survey whatever or to monitor whatever. Thank you. Very much. I think Carl Bildt wanted to come and... I mean, it's a very, very important and very difficult question. Yes. And, and I, I wish I had a clear-cut answer. I don't. But just, just illustrate the problem from the Swedish point of view. Uh, as said, uh, we have, as I said earlier, really, we have an extremely strong constitutional protection for the freedom of information and freedom of speech. I'm in favor of that. I've been in sort of previous capacities, I've been very much against introducing anything that made it possible to have further restrictions on the freedom of information and freedom of speech. We had a very strong voice, strong voices in the Swedish debate 
that wanted to change the constitutional provisions and protection so that we could interfere against child pornography. Very difficult case. Uh, then to say, I'm in favor of freedom of information, accordingly, it's okay with child pornography all over the place. I mean, you lose that politi political battle qu quite fast. We still have the line. The compromise in Sweden at the moment, and I say it's a compromise, it's not a good one, is that now we have the ISP seeming voluntarily taking child pornography off. Uh, is this a good compromise? I'm not quite certain it is. But at the same time, I would be distinctly uncomfortable to change the Swedish constitution to say that this should be constitutionally restricted. Because I fear that there will be others advocating other things as well to be added to that. And that's why I say hold the fort as long as we can and see if we can handle the problem in some other case. It's not ideal. But I'm just saying that to illustrate the the difficult balancing acts that are there in a free society. I would like to have a system where the ISPs, as you say, could be free of that particular, uh, that particular task. That would be the best. But at the same time, I would be extremely reluctant to include further going legal objections and restrictions on the freedom of internet or the freedom of the speech or the freedom of information. It's a policy dilemma. And some of us who are active in politics know that policy dilemmas is our daily bread and business. Russia Abdullah, would you like to, to comment yes, on that Yes, I question? actually absolutely agree with that. And right now in, in Egypt, we have a case that's kind of coming back to the surface of, of uh, you know, the parliament wanting to pass legislation to, uh, to restrict child pornography. And I actually have a whole book on that. It's called Policing the Internet in the Arab World. Um, um, and from everything that's, that's out there that's documented, I mean, the regimes that do use the excuse of uh, pornography or moral standards or whatever and end up uh, blocking every single yeah. human rights page that exists. Mm. They block everything about women's rights, children's rights, um, any religious um, minorities' uh, rights. Uh, I mean, just associate the word rights with everything, with anything and it's blocked uh, in these countries and they do it in, in the name of moral standards and they market it uh, in such a way to actually get the people's uh, uh, to get the people of the country to stand behind it as something good because you know this internet is this big dangerous thing coming from uh, uh, Western countries uh, to invade the moral you know standards of of, uh, of others but but I I would like to go back to the comment about the the definition of internet freedom because I just I wouldn't let that go. Uh, I think it's within my freedom for me to be able to walk out on the street with a mobile phone without the government necessarily knowing where I am at every single moment of the day if I am a lawful citizen. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, the idea of, um, you know, code of law, and granted, some countries do follow the code of law more, more than others, but even these countries, when need be, then they detain people, send them over to other countries, such as Egypt, for example, to torture and, 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 and the people that they want tortured because they have a rule of law and they don't want to do that on their own soil. We've all seen that. This is documented everywhere. I'm not telling any secrets. Um, so the idea of, again, I mean, sure, privacy, the definition of privacy has changed with the introduction of the internet and social networks. There's no going back on that. Uh, Thank you. I'm going to, there's a very patient person at the back <laughs> who's just been waiting for ages to ask a question. I also want to come to the remote curator and then I've got some more questions. So I think we'll just take a load of comments from the audience now and we'll get reactions as and when, but, but let's, let's give people the uh, chance to speak. Thank you. I'm Jeremy Zimmerman. I come from the internet and I'm the co-founder of La Quadrature du Net, a citizen advocacy group defending freedoms online. Um, I'm very much worried that the, the most important characteristics of a free internet is its nature of a universal and decentralized platform. Everybody has access to every content service and application and the ability to publish some. This is roughly a definition of net neutrality. And as soon as you think in centralized ways, you take the risk to harm this decentralized nature. Uh, when you filter, you block access to child porn, you can tell that you're doing it wrong. 
when you do it in, when you do that instead of attacking it at the source and making the people who do it in, in front of their responsibility. And so we, we are used to the, this political storytelling of the, the four horsemen of the infocalypse, uh, pedophiles, <laughs> terrorists, drug uh, dealers, and so on, justified centralized measures to restrict freedom online. Uh, we're used to the mass surveillance that is being deployed all around the world. But I wanted to point out, actually after this gentleman from the ISP uh, industry, that there is also a very uh, local and European problem where um, internet service provider do restrict access in the name of new business models, do restrict connections. And that's the very same hardware that is being used for mass surveillance, for centralizing control in the name of the uh, horsemen of the infocalypse, or for hurting net neutrality. And I would like to see a regulation um, guaranteeing this net neutrality because all the schemes towards self-regulation have so far been proven uh, inefficient. Thank you. Can we hear from our, our curators, our online curators? Have there been any response to the questions that we posed or to, to our conversations? I think uh, it's safe to say that there have been more questions than <laughs> answers online as well. It, it started off with, with Alec Ross notes uh, where you described it as a war and everyone was kind of interested in knowing what the casualties are in this war. What, what kind of collateral damage is there when, when the forces fight like they do right now online? And, and that's probably a question to... to um, for later on. Uh, there's also the question about when, when governments limiting freedom to the open internet, will that cause users to increasingly move to darknets? Also as a point to you. But I think the big question right now is, is kind of the philosophical question that Mons Odlo touched upon uh, with his vision of the extension of the public room. It's a very human question related to tech lawful inception. Does the unregulated internet include the right to anonymity as well or only freedom of expression? So what happens with anonymity? Thank you. Very, uh, very provocative questions. Um, does anybody want to come back on yeah, this? I can, yeah, Robin, go, Robin go take that, yes, Thanks. Um, just I want to comment first quickly on the whole aspect of surveillance because I think surveillance right now is very much on mobile phones and so on. But moving forward, what happens when we have RFID sensors, when the Internet of Things surveillance over everything and will we be able to keep up with what's happening? So I think it's very important to be thinking forward too in terms of legislation and so on regarding surveillance. In terms of anonymity, I think it does. You should have the right to be anonymous as well. Uh, it, it allows freedom of expression because I might not be able to express myself in my current. I mean, networks are, you know, they constrict you as well. Even though I'm free to express myself on the internet, my friends and so on might not want me. I might feel, you know, oh, maybe I shouldn't try that out in front of them. But I would like to be able to perhaps experience something somewhere else without anyone knowing who I am. I have two avatars when I'm in virtual worlds. I have my business avatar and I have my exploring avatar where I'm out and exploring and finding new places where innovation is happening. But maybe I don't want necessarily everybody to know right away that I'm a business school professor. So I think that uh, you know, it, you should, it, does, it does come along with the right with anonymity. Regarding privacy, it's this public space. When the telephone came, people were, <gasps> Somebody's calling into my house. I can't see their face. They're entering my private space without me opening the door and letting them in. And now we don't think twice about a mobile phone. So I think it is, we do kind of sense adjust and, and you know, adapt to our technology, but it's a... Yeah, so we, we have to kind of calm down from the moral panic that any technology, any new technology or change brings to us. Could I Mons, just, yeah, yes, please, just a Mons empirical Adler. thing, I mean, I just to have a look at what the internet thinks will bring us and so on. I mean, I have this door lock at home. Uh, I have an engine and I have an application in my phone which makes me possible to open and close my, my door. Um, you know, good if I'm not at home and my, you know, gra grandmother wanna turn off, you know, or get into an apartment or, you know, some delivery service wanna deliver a package or anything, I can just open the door. I mean, that set of data, I mm, wouldn't yeah. want, you know, anybody to know at first stage. But if you look at it at a larger stage, I would probably be ready to, to serve that data to the municipality to say that locks in the area where I live are normally closed around yeah. 8.30. 
and they were closed for the rest of the day. That would mean that the municipality could deliver better buses at that moment. So, I mean, there are those different levels of mm -hmm. anonymity, but, you know, the same data can be used in several layers, and I think we need to be ready for, for that kind of situation. The thieves would know you're not at home. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I had a question from over here, and then one in the center, so let's just take those two. Um, thanks very much. My name is uh, Amr Garbeya. I come uh, um, from Cairo. Um, um, I work with technology for social change, effectively making me uh, one of the subjects of Russia's research. And I'd like um, um, just to, uh, for the benefit of everybody, uh, give you a reflection from Tahrir. During the uh, most critical days, the, the most important technologies that uh, I have used were um, stones, sticks, and blankets, not my cell phone. <laughs> um, however, uh, trying to develop uh, where Russia stopped, started from, uh, protecting us against uh, the kill switch and, and holding uh, someone really high up, uh, the hierarchy responsible is, is good and, and, and just and fair, maybe. Uh, however, um, how about a fix for the, for the problem itself? Um, uh, there will be uh, technological developments that will make it impossible for someone to actually control the entire network. It's called a Wi-Fi mesh. It's called the decentralized social network that le works either on the level of, of content, on, on the level of Facebook and the Google, but also on the level of, of the telecom them themselves. Uh, and, and I think that, uh, going back to Alec, this is the most uh, uh, important, defining development uh, in, in the coming few years. Uh, and the question would be, um, how are we going to uh, deal with that? Because just like the telephone, it's coming. Uh, and what about rule of law? I think the question is not, uh, what are we going uh, to do with the, with the technologies? Are we going to allow them in? Um, that's, that, that would be asking ourselves the wrong question. The right question is how we are going to adapt. Um, uh, and uh, it seems that the decentralized uh, infrastructure, I still come in a country where the Wi-Fi mesh is illegal, uh, but that's, uh, um, that's something we are going to have to work with. It's going to be uh, legalized in Egypt. Uh, we know how, very well how to deal with the kill switch, but later on, uh, uh, what are we going to do in terms of uh, rule of law? Thank you. Thank you. Marcus Kuma, can we, can we get a mic down front, please? While we're waiting for the mic, does anybody want to, in 30 seconds, respond Could to I, this? Just another session of empirical thoughts on, on Anam you know, where people want to be anonymous. Like you said, there is a lot of analog ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the live videos that we're receiving out of Syria the last half years, we've been asking ourselves, why are they always filming on the roof of the tops, uh, or top of the roofs, you know, mm -hmm. and the demonstrations are down. The reason for that was that people didn't want to show their faces so the Syrian government could pick them out. So they chose a very analog way of saying, I want to stay anonymous, but they still got the message out that there were hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people out demonstrating. You know, there are ways to turn not only the technology off, but... And, but and of course, the, the, you know, the technology that Bambooza allows yeah. with this uh, real-time streaming has been, uh, the, you know, the front pages of Bambooza are full of live footage yeah. from, uh, from Syria at the moment. Marcus Kuma, the Internet Society. Yes, thank you, Emily. Uh, I'm, I'm the face to the quote of Minister Bilt in his opening address when he said, quoted the Internet Society in the speech at the uh, United Nations Human Rights Council. Uh, it is a great discussion, a great morning so far. I have not a question, more a comment on the term internet freedom. I'm always a little bit uh, skeptical. I feel it can be used by Western democracies as exporting uh, what they believe is internet freedom and not looking at what they're doing in their own countries. However, the discussion has proved me wrong. We are looking at what Western democracies do at their own countries. And uh, I was pleased to see that Alec mentioned SOPA and PIPA, for instance. These are clearly attempts of tightening laws uh, that would restrict uh, the openness of the Internet. We at the Internet Society, we prefer talking about openness. Uh, openness in all its dimensions. The Internet is about being open. It is about open standards. It is about open processes, all the standard and policy development processes are open. Uh, you are free to add innovation to the internet without asking for permission, and this is precisely what we want to preserve. 
some comments that were made by a colleague from Eurispa are extremely relevant. What we see now is increasing pressure on intermediaries to police the internet outside the rule of law. And why? Just because it's technologically feasible. But it should not be done just because it's feasible if it's not the right thing to do. Nobody asks the post office to open your parcels you get through the post office. Why should internet service providers open the parcels just because they can do it? There's the packet inspection. Yes, of course, there may be reasons to do it, but then, as you do with telephone surveillance, it should be done under strict observance of the rule of law and of due process. So again, to sum up, a great panel, a great morning, but uh, let's not forget about the openness in all its dimensions. Thank you. Yes, uh, the, the, not just the openness in all its dimensions, but also that the, you know, are we doing these things because the technology enables us to? What is at one hand a great enabler of innovation and freedom is of course in the wrong, we would say in the wrong hands, which is always other people's hands. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a source of suppression, uh, surveillance and, and so on. Uh, there are two questions over there, yeah. thank you. Uh, Richard Allen at, at Facebook. I was interested in picking up again on Alex's point about countries that are still making their mind up. Uh, and Carl Bildt's point about the policy dilemmas. And it seems to me that in, in every government there will be uh, opposing forces. There will be people who say in the names of security, et cetera, et cetera, we need these additional restrictions. And there'll be people in government who say, no, the open internet is far more important. We don't need them. Uh, and so my question really is for governments who are struggling with that dilemma, where are the models that help them to choose the open side? And I think very practically in the case of Egypt, as Egypt has rebuilt a government uh, following the incidents that occurred there, uh, what models has Egypt been looking to and how's that dilemma been playing out between the different forces in government? Thank you. Rasha Abdullah? Yeah, it's uh, actually the, the dilemma is now between the, the people and the people in government, the people, the people on the streets and the, and, and the people in government. Uh, I'm for openness everywhere, but the problem is until the technologies that allow openness get to the more um, repressive regimes, we have a problem within the more repressive regimes. I mean, obviously, the you know, technologies that allow openness, um, technologies in general are developed in the Western world much rather than in the, in the uh, well, repressive regime kind of, you know, less democratic societies. And the problem is the less democratic, so, and I do understand that some of these technologies are going to be transferred whether the governments want it or not, but that's going to take some time. In, in the meantime, what happens is repressive regimes always want to repress people by definition. And so because somebody raised the, the point of, of demand earlier, uh, the demand will always be there. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, a responsibility of uh, the more democratic societies that have uh, the luxury to, to claim being democratic, to prove that it is indeed democratic and to try to restrict exports of, um, of software, of tools, of um, technologies that allow the governments to be uh, repressive and to monitor people's uh, internet traffic without being, you know, according to the, uh, the conduct of the law necessarily. Russia, uh, Egypt. Can, can I, sorry to interrupt. Can I just pose the question to you again? Which countries is Egypt looking at? for best practices about openness on the internet? I, th I, I don't think there is, a, there is an organized effort to do that. That's what I'm saying. Well, who, I think would you, who would you recommend? What countries would you recommend? Uh, uh, I, that's a very tough question, tough question, honestly. Yeah, I mean, I'll take a shot. Can I no take a shot? So I, think there's actually <laughs> a I think there's a fascinating model here. If you look at the dissolution of the Soviet Union at the end of the 80s, beginning of the 1990s, um, Estonia and Belarus had roughly equivalent GDPs. There were bread lines in Tallinn in 1990, 1991, 1992. And what, what's fascinating to me is to sort of look at Belarus and Estonia um, over the sweep of the past 20 years. They chose entirely different models. What, Tallinn, what, what Estonia chose was a model that was rooted in openness um, with accelerating the connectivity of its citizens and you know, making technology sort of a community asset, so to speak. By contrast, Belarus sort of said, we are going to take a more command and control 
approach to our information environment. We are not going to foster openness. We are not going to let the internet out widely. And so what's interesting to me is to just look at Belarus and Estonia, again, having started from roughly equivalent places um, somewhat uh, in the early 90s and to see where they are respectively right now. Estonia doing quite well, Belarus continuing to struggle. Um, you know, I don't think they're perfect analogies as they translate into the Maghreb or the, or the Levant, but I do think that to the extent that countries transitioning from authoritarianism into some form of democracy, to the extent that they can look at those models that have worked well economically from pivots out of authoritarianism, I think it all lends itself to relatively open information models. And that is inclusive, not just of the quote unquote internet, but also open media, freedom of expression more broadly and other such things. Thank you. Carl Bilt, did you want to, to help out um, on Richard Allen's question about um, countries which have best practices that might help uh, that might help Egypt, um, or might <laughs> help others. Might um, help others. I, I think Estonia, Belarus is good. I did North South Korea. I mean, you yep. can have you can have a lot of those examples around the world. Then the tricky thing is, of course, that uh, I mean, e Egypt is one example. You could take the entire Muslim world. Um, that the the value system is sometimes somewhat different. Uh, we have that also debate within our societies because we are far more multicultural societies now that we used to be, we encounter this sort of clash of different values that are coming from different traditions. That's truly a difficult one at times. And you have, I mean, look at, the, look at Egypt. The difference between the Tahir Square revolution and the election result. That illustrates the tension that is there in a society. And any society will have to include both the Tahir Square and the election result, and moving forward. I'm, I'm saying that by us illustrating the, the nature of the problem. Mm -hmm. I don't think there is any model. I think there are a lot of lessons. And, and uh, on Egypt, I will just say that where Egypt goes will be tremendously important for the entire Arab world. There's no country as important for the future of that big revolution for 22 countries, nearly 400 million people. So the way you shape your future, and you will have to do it, will be decisive for a very important part of the world. Uh, it, because it is interesting that the, the language used in, in support of openness or freedom is very much fighting the front line. We're, well, talking, we're, we're yeah. using warlike analogies. I think some, some people were commenting, is this a way of exporting developed country values? And, and, and what we're hearing but from it, both but of these... But if I may comment on that, I mean, it, it pretty much is, and that's yeah. why I'm, I'm asking mm. the the uh, the more democratic societies to not help the repressive regimes in their war against their own yeah. people. Uh, and actually, the same countries that kind of export these uh, repressive tools are actually the same countries that export tear gas to our government. So I mean, it's it's very uh, the the analogy is very much there. It is, you know, I mean, do you want to take the side of the people or do you want to take the side of the repressive regimes? And every government that has the luxury to do that is going to have to stand up and take a very clear position on where they want to be. Do they want to take the side of the people or do they want to take the side of the government? And so that would be your message to Alex, uh, fence-sitting nations, would it? Get off the fence. <laughs> <laughs> Decide look, who. I, look, I, I, I think the next three to five years are going to be more conflict-ridden on the net. Now, if the language so sounds yeah. bellicose, then I think it's justifiably so. You know, I think that transnational conflict on the internet is going to is going to grow over the next 3 to 5 years right now we see significant increases in the number of cyber attacks uh crossing borders here's what i imagine and something that i predict is going to happen imagine what happens when there is a cyber attack from you know a big country that promulgates cyber cyber attacks and it is to a private sector company and part of what they're trying to do is extract the intellectual property from that company what happens if the sophisticated engineering team of that private sector company doesn't merely defend itself, but sa says, hey, we are now going to defend ourselves by attacking the source of the original attack? So what's going to be fascinating is I think the nature of conflict itself in the cyber domain is going to change so that the, the things that are smashing up against each other are not just nation states, they aren't just governments. But imagine a team of 100 very sophisticated computer scientists 
fighting the cyber army of another country. I can imagine these things happening in the next three years. And maybe I spend my time just in entirely two dark places, you know, witnessing the rise of such things. But I do think that to the extent that, that the conflict on the net is rooted in language that, that sounds like warfare or other such things, I think it reflects the very simple, sad fact of as these networking technologies become more sophisticated, as they disrupt power structures, then it will produce more conflict, especially where established hierarchies and governments uh, feel threatened and feel either like they should lash out or defend themselves. Now I can see that people on yeah. the panel are wanting to come <laughs> in and I've got people on the audience on to come. There's yeah. been two very patient people waiting over there and you, sir, I'm going to go over there. I'm going to come back to Mons, whatever they ask, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anwar Hussain from Bangladesh, journalist. I just want to know uh, a simple question. It's internet freedom for global development. It's not any more question about developing countries and developed countries development. It's not a question of core countries or the periphery countries development. The question is global development and we are promoting freedom, internet freedom. What is Swedish role, those who we are promoting now, Swedish role for the activists, those whose life or lives are in risk because people are in the field. Those who we are promoting freedom, they are not in the field. And what is Swedish role to save their lives, whereas Sweden cannot even rescue of its three journalists, Johan Porshan, Martin Shibdi, and Dovid Isaac, sitting in jail in Horn of Africa. Thank you. So, what is the Swedish role? Can I Could ask it? you? I don't know if Mon you can ask that, but <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say I told say you so, I was going to ask you this I question. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Now, I would just like to comment on Alex's uh, input here, because it's I mean, that is what we have been going through over the last two years here now. So, I mean, we were the second service to be shut down in, in, in uh, Egypt. It was Twitter and then it was Bambooser and 12 oh. hours later it was Facebook and then they shut the internet completely. Uh, the same story went down in Bahrain. Uh, it was a smaller, you know, the international movement didn't move as quickly there because they didn't shut down internet. Uh, in the political world, the internet seems to be quite binary because they lowered the capacity of the net to a limit where it's always almost useless, but it didn't close it completely. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're seeing in Syria now is the same. We're being blocked again. We're you know, a small company of 13 employees. How will we make a move? You know, where are we supposed to go to tell, you know, hey, something going on that, that is not okay? and who are there to help us. So it's the same question for us. Mm. So your question is answered with a question. Mm. I yeah. it's a, well, I think that that's, that's actually a very honest answer because as we're, we're exploring the questions. No, yeah, we are exploring the questions. So we are indicating all of the policy dilemmas. In this, but this particular case, um, what can we do? Well, we can try to open up the net as much as we can in different ways. Uh, are there limits to what we can do? There are distinct limits to what we can do. Um, but we should try to do our, our utmost. That's why we should sort of, as I said, swarm them with nets, these societies, the one way or the other. There are problems associated with that because there will be misuse of the nets as well by governments. I mean, even cars can be used to transport people to prisons. And railways took people to Auschwitz. Uh, but at the end of the day, these technologies liberate these societies anyhow. Uh, we, we, we must clearly see the policy dilemmas uh, that are there. Then what, what, what can Sweden do in individual cases around the world? I mean, to be quite honest, we can't invade the entire world and change it. Not even the United States <laughs> has that capacity, although it sometimes sounded like it in American political <laughs> rhetoric. Uh, but, but we can act by a sort of diplomatic and political means. And then I would say what we can do in this particular case is, sounds somewhat bizarre, but a conference like this. We mobilize opinion and debate around the world. And I think that is, to some extent, 
in this verge of hyperconnectivity more powerful long term than any invading army could really be. Take some time, take some patience and determination. That's the way to do it, I think. It's, it's raising the issues and sensitizing people to the yeah. very difficult questions that we're all facing. I have um, one question over here. It's working? Yes. I'm Eduardo Bertoni. I'm from the Center for Studies on Freedom of Expression at Palermo University School of Law in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Very briefly, uh, one question and, and, and two brief, brief comments. Um, we were talking about internet freedom and um, I'm glad to hear Alec Ross saying that about the importance of respecting due process, the rule of law, in any case that uh, policymakers or countries are thinking in some way to block internet freedom. But at the same time, I'm, I'm puzzled because uh, we are missing something here, which is intellectual property regulations and internet freedom. And my feeling is that there is some sort of contradictions coming from some countries, including the US. I heard Secretary of State Hillary Clinton very supportive of internet freedom. That's great. But the policy of the US in terms of intellectual property and mm. internet freedom is not consistent, in my view, yes. with those uh, uh, principles. Can I just uh, stop you there because yeah. you're raising a very important no, point and we're into the last me, five let, minutes. Yes, let, let me add something. This well, is can a I very just say, sir, that, that your, your point was, was I'd like <coughs> to, to get a, a response very quickly in the last five minutes on this dichotomy between internet freedoms on the one hand, the role of government in suppressing them, but also to quote Sergey Brin of Google <laughs> the other day, he said that he viewed the biggest threat to mm. internet freedom not from China or Russia, but from the US creative industries. Alec Gross, can I have your comment on that? Sure, so there is an implicit tension between uh, the openness of the internet and copyrighted material. And I think the Obama administration has come down unambiguously in the right place. So if you look what, what the White House published while Congress was deliberating SOPA and PIPA, uh, you can say, you know, it, what it said was, we will not support legislation uh, that seeks to protect intellectual property that also curtails free expression. And so, you know, a lot of people, you know, I get hectored a lot of the time about SOPA and PIPA, and what I have to explain to people is that SOPA and PIPA is something that was proposed in our Congress, but it was never voted out of Congress, and point in fact, the Obama administration announced that it would veto it. So, you know, I think that while there's a lot of rhetoric coming out of the United States about the implicit tension between intellectual property rights and an open internet, you have to look at what the actual policies are. And the policies right now very clearly support an open internet. Um, so that's thing one. Thing two I think is I think- we might not get to thing two, okay. <laughs> sure. but, but, but because there's, there's a lady who's been wanting to oh, ask a question, but can we get a microphone there? Or you actually do thing two while we get the microphone to that lady. So thing two is what I hope is that rather than taking a regulatory or statutory approach to solving these issues, what I hope is that the creative industry and the internet industry, Southern California and Northern California, can come together and say, let's develop watermarking technologies or other such things so that we can have an engineering-based solution as opposed to a government-based solution to uh, protecting IP on the internet. Yes, uh, uh, I was talking to, a regu to the UK regulator who said he was recently in a, uh, in a meeting with content people and internet people and their chief lawyers offered to take each other outside and give each other a good smack. So um, I think that perhaps yeah. that such constructive engagement and dialogue can be encouraged. Yeah. Madam. <laughs> On. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm Sharon Hom, and from the NGO Human Rights in China. We're based in Hong Kong and New York. Um, so thank you very much for a very amazing morning and this panel. I wanted to put a quick comment and open up a question for not 
because we're out of time here, but I hope that it's picked up by the rest of the um, discussions for the next day and a half. We've heard some really powerful words, and I think many of my NGO colleagues and I have commented on how powerful the words were, and China has been referenced a number of times. I think it's important to uh, share this comment that China both challenges a lot of the model and assumptions that's reflected in the argument that openness is inevitably linked to economic development. That is, an open society, an open government, you know, will inevitably like Estonia and Belarus. Whereas China, which is more like Belarus, is actually very powerful economically, more like the US. So I think that China both um, gives additional evidence that what are you going to do with an authoritarian regime who has one of the largest double-digit growing economies in the world that very few governments and companies will say no to. And I think, on the other hand, 30 years later, belatedly, but happening, is that China's also the evidence for the fact that it's not sustainable and that it's clearly from the bottom up starting to fray. But that message isn't really taken as seriously, I think, yet by the international community. So the integration of internet freedom into development policy and practice, which has been emphasized this morning, the question is, and we need greater discussion because I recognize the complexity of this, how will the uh, challenges, what are some of the challenges? Can we talk about that? Can we hear that from the governments and from the business sector about the challenges of integrating internet freedom into and mainstreaming into the trade policies? And for those fence-sitting nations, China, with a different group of like-minded governments, uh, are going to help with that fence-sitting decision too. And they're helping that decision-making with very clear economic, military aid, and development packages. So there's some real incentive there for them to get off the fence and perhaps be on the wrong side of that fence. Thank you. And with that comment, I regret that we are out of time because he who must be obeyed <laughs> has told me that we are out of time. So I would like you Can to thank... One last oh, point. Okay. It's not just the government. It's everybody's responsibility to create awareness. We're all online. Got out of your, your closed networks within Facebook, within LinkedIn, Twitter. Look at what is going on around in the world and post that to your networks. I think it's everybody's responsibility to create awareness about what's happening. I just yep. wanted to say thank that. Thank you very yeah. much, Robin Tegland. <laughs> so thank yep. you to all our panelists, yep. Carl Bilt, Robin Tegland, Monsadla, Rasha Abdullah, and of course, Alec Ross. Thank you. Sorry. Just